Dear friends, good evening. Welcome to what will no doubt be another great night at Temple Emmanuel. But as we begin, I want to hold in our prayers the families of those killed in today's tra tragic building collapse in Harlem and those injured and missing. May God send healing and strength to the grieving and wounded and return home safely and speedily those not yet found. Amen. Again, I thank our program committee, chaired by Dr. Claudia Platel, aided, of course, by our administrative vice president and Skirball Center director, Dr. Mark Weistuck, our administrator, Mark Heitlinger, and our librarian, Liza Stabler. Tonight, as we continue our series on the history and future of Reformed Judaism, we're going to explore how liberal Jews create paths toward the sacred. From 1885, with the first reform platform stating we hold that Judaism presents the highest conception of the God idea to the most recent platform of 1999 which declares we affirm the reality and oneness of God even as we may differ in our understanding of the divine presence reform Jews have wrestled with the concept of the divine the meaning of holiness and the implications of the covenant relationship Tonight, we will explore how Judaism's great theologians have shaped the ways in which liberal Jews have made Judaism relevant to their modern and even postmodern lives. And to lead us in that journey is one of the Jewish community's preeminent theologians and teachers. Dr. Ellen M. Umansky is the Carl and Dorothy Bennett Professor of Judaic Studies in the Department of Religious Studies and the director of the Bennett Center for Judaic Studies at Fairfield University, positions she has held since joining the Fairfield faculty in the fall of 1994. From 1994 through, through, through 2010, she also served as founding director of Fairfield University's interdisciplinary undergraduate program and minor in Judaic Studies, the oldest such program at any Jesuit college or university in the United States. Dr. Umansky received her BA in philosophy from Wellesley, her Master of Arts in Religion from Yale University Divinity School, and her PhD in Religion from Columbia. Her fields of scholarly expertise include late 19th and 20th century Jewish history and thought in the United States and England, with a particular interest in lay religious leadership, liberal Judaism, and, the, and Jewish women's spirituality. She's taught at our Movements Seminary here in New York, the Hebrew Union College, as well as at Emory, Vassar, Haverford, Princeton, Columbia, and Barnard. She's written or edited five books and almost 100 scholarly articles, book chapters, and encyclopedia articles. She's vice president and president-elect of the Southern Jewish Historical Society, co-chair of the Network of Judaic Studies Program Directors, sponsored by the American Jewish Studies Association, and member of the board of directors of Theta Alpha Kappa, the National Religious Studies Honor Society. She's also a member of Phi Beta Kappa Alpha Sigma Nu, the National Jesuit Honor Society, and the academic boards of the Jewish Women's Archive, the American Jewish Historical Society, and the Hadassah Brandeis Institute. So to explore with us the creation and development of liberal Jewish theologies in America, one of our community's greatest thinkers. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ellen Umansky. Well, thank you so much. I definitely cannot live up to that introduction. <laughs> Really, uh, but as you can see, I'm I'm busy. I mean that I think that's that what something we got out of that. But it's really a, a pleasure, really, to be here tonight. Uh, I last spoke at Temple Emanuel a long time ago, before I started teaching it at Fairfield. Actually, um, I don't know if it was in this room. I don't think so. It was in some other some other room in the building. But I, it's it's wonderful, really, to be here with you tonight. And to talk about, as you heard, how liberal Jews create paths towards the sacred. Uh, as I was preparing what I would speak to you about this evening, I realized that maybe I had bitten off more than I could chew. Uh, this is a huge topic. And 
you know, we, we could spend 14 weeks, as I do with my undergraduates up at Fairfield, uh, exploring this topic. But what I want to do this evening is at least share with you some of the ways in which, in the last 100 years or so, liberal Jews have attempted to create paths to God. And in order to do so, what I want to do with you is to focus on different liberal Jewish theologians of the 20th century, primarily in the United States. And to help focus my remarks this evening and also for you to have texts that you can look at, and hopefully you will take these handouts home and look at them more carefully. One of my colleagues at Fairfield, who's old, older than I am, said, you're not doing a PowerPoint presentation? I said, no, I'm not doing a PowerPoint presentation. I have more. So you don't have to look at them right yet. We're not going to look at them in a second. But hopefully this will be of interest to you. And I think I'll leave some here in case some other people come up. Everybody have it? And I am going to keep watching my watch. I want to end in time for us to have plenty of time for discussion. So I don't know if we'll get through all of these readings. I tried to limit myself to double-sided, but if there's some more there. I, I have more if you need it. Okay. Okay. Everybody have one? Okay. Okay. Well, great. Again, we're, we're going to come to them, so you don't have to look at it. Um, you don't have to look at it this second. Okay, well, for those of you who have never formally studied either liberal Judaism or Jewish theology, you know, it may come as a surprise to you to know that there are, in fact, liberal Jewish theologians. Uh, I've heard members of my own Reform congregation up in White Plains, um, when you know, they ask me, what kind of work do I do at the university? What is my research? And I talk about Jewish theology. I would say, you know, when I talk about liberal Jewish theology, most of my fellow congregants have absolutely no idea that liberal Jewish theology even exists. Uh, in fact, maybe, you know, some members of Temple Emmanuel say this as well, but I know in my congregation, often when people are asked, well, you know, you belong to a reform congregation, what exactly does that mean? What does reform stand for? Uh, and unfortunately, I still hear the answer, okay, reform Judaism, and this is from affiliated reform Jews. Reform Judaism, well, orthodoxy stands for the most, conservative stands for somewhere in the middle, and reform Judaism basically stands for the least, uh, which implies in that statement that it's easy to be a reformed Jew. Now, I know David Ellenson came here, was it months ago that he came? Months, yeah. yeah, and hopefully when David came, you know, he emphasized the fact that to the creators of reformed Judaism in Germany, to be a reformed Jew was anything but easy. In fact, the early reformers really saw it more difficult to be a reformed Jew than to be an orthodox Jew because you didn't have a blueprint in front of you telling you how to lead a Jewish life that it was up to the individual through his or her own religious consciousness to figure out what it meant to be a Jew. And in fact, when Reform Judaism came to the United States, basically in the 1840s and later, it came here and helped and developed a very clear ideological or even theological set of principles, many of which coalesced in 1885 uh, in the Pittsburgh Platform. Now, I'm not tonight going to go over the Pittsburgh platform, although I have to say of all of the major platforms or principles of the reform movement, the 1885 
Pittsburgh platform remains my favorite. And it's my favorite because it's the most concise. Because in 1885, when Rabbi Kaufman Kohler convened the Pittsburgh platform, and he wrote almost every statement in the Pittsburgh platform, he had a clear sense of what Reform Judaism was. And to Kohler, who would go on to write a massive book on Jewish theology, Reform Judaism very much had to do with God. Although, in the 1885 platform, as somebody who was a rationalist, Rabbi Kohler didn't want to quite commit himself to the reality of God. And I would say it didn't take until 1999 and the Statement of Principles for the leaders of Reform Judaism to come up with this notion of the reality of God as opposed to the idea of God. In fact, in 1937, when members of the CCAR met in Columbus, Ohio, they hammered out what they called the Columbus Platform a platform of beliefs that is very similar to the 1885 Pittsburgh platform. But there are two major differences in the Columbus platform versus the Pittsburgh platform. Did Gary Zola talk about this when he was here? Oh, oh, okay. Well, one of the major differences is that the 1885 Pittsburgh platform talks about reformed Jews as believing in the idea of God, And in 1937, the members of the Central Conference of American Rabbis were willing to commit themselves to belief in the reality of God. That is, Reform Judaism in America shifts from equating Reform Judaism with rational religion. I mean, ideas can be rational ideas, right? We're talking about the presence of God. It may not be purely rational. So one of the big shifts in the reform movement in America from 1885 to 1937 is more of a warming up to this notion of God as a reality. And of course, the second major shift is that in 1885 in the Pittsburgh platform, Kaufman Kohler essentially articulated the words that we consider ourselves no longer a people, we are not a nation, we are a religious brotherhood. Uh, So the idea of no longer seeing the Jews as a people, but instead talking about Judaism as the individual religion of autonomous Jews, that's very much in the Pittsburgh platform. 1937, Hitler's in power. The Nuremberg Laws in 1935 take away citizenship in Germany from Jews. So for the reform movement to come to realize that, in fact, to be a Jew is more than being an individual in his or her own living room, to bring back into reform Judaism in a formal way this notion of peoplehood was something affirmed in 1937, and it is still affirmed by leaders of the reform movement today. Now, what does all of this have to do with theology? Uh, As I said before, in 1885, when Kaufman Kohler wrote the Pittsburgh Platform, theology for him was very much on his mind. But in terms of the development of liberal theology in America, there really are a number of European theologians, Jewish theologians, who make a major impact on the directions in which not just Reform Judaism, but liberal Judaism in general would go. And so I decided to put together in this handout Uh, To begin with, three major European influences on liberal Judaism in the United States. Uh, Believe me, I could have picked three other individuals, but in thinking about who really had an impact on the direction of liberal Jewish theology, these are the three that really came to mind. Uh, Rabbi Leo Beck, who had a tremendous impact on Reform Judaism, both in Germany and in the United States, and in the direction in which it would go. Martin Buber, who not only had a major impact and still has a major impact on liberal Judaism, but on liberal Christianity as well. Uh, And then Franz Rosenzweig, uh, who continues to have a deep impact on liberal Jewish theology, not so much because of what Rosenzweig thought of as his magnum opus, a book called The Star of Redemption, but really through the leadership role that Franz Rosenzweig took in the 1920s in Frankfurt when he founded the first school of adult Jewish learning. So I'm not going to really focus, I'm not going to focus on the biographies of these people as much as I always love to put people in historical context, but I really want to focus on their ideas. So first we'll we'll look at uh, Leo Beck. 
We are back from 1873. I at least have to tell you when he lived from. He lived a long life, 1873 to 1956. Uh, and this excerpt is from Leo Beck's most influential theological book. You know, after World War II, he wrote a number of books about peoplehood. There's a wonderful collection of his essays called This People Israel. But I would say that in terms of his theology, the book that really made Leo Beck such a major presence in the reform movement uh, was this book that he first wrote in 1905, but then significantly revised and expanded in 1922. And the book is called The Essence of Judaism. So I'm just going to read you this brief excerpt from it. He wrote, from faith in God springs faith in man. We were created by God. We live through and in God but we do so as free and independent human beings who are called to ethical action. Though Judaism sees man as free and independent, he is not entirely separate from God and not merely outside of him. Here its outlook is distinguished from, quote, moralistic deism and from rationalism, both of which know only a distant God beyond the reach of the seeking heart, a God who exists merely as an idea. Judaism, however, and this is the most important sentence by Beck that I'm going to read. Judaism, however, is neither a religion without commandment, nor it should be a religion, nor religion without mystery. Its God is neither the merely imminent God who dwells in all things and beings, nor the transcendent God who is above and beyond us. All right, so in 1885 in the United States, Reform rabbis agree that Judaism is largely a rationalistic religion. They commit themselves to this ethical ideal, which they call God. But in 1922, Leo Beck writes a book in which he says, look, I'm rationalist, just like the rest of you. Leo Beck was a rationalist. And like the leaders of Reform Judaism in Germany and in America, and like a fellow German Jewish philosopher by the name of Hermann Cohen, who wrote a book just a few years before um, Beck's second edition of The Essence of Judaism, in which Hermann Cohen maintained that Judaism is actually the most rational of any religion. Hermann Cohen went so far as to claim there is nothing in Judaism that is non-rational. And that's why I'm not including Hermann Cohen, because that would be way too long a discussion. But the truth is that most Reformed Jews agreed with Hermann Cohen. That is, that Judaism was a rational religion, meaning that all of the truths of Judaism could be ascertained through our own ability to think as rational human beings. And for Hermann Cohen, God was very much an ethical idea or an ideal. That is, for Cohen, Hermann Cohen didn't talk about the reality of God any more than the creators of the Pittsburgh platform talked about the reality of God in 1885. What Beck adds to the discussion, and that's why he is so important, especially within the context of Reform Judaism, is he isn't saying that Judaism isn't rational, but he's saying rationalism isn't enough. That as liberal Jews, we may feel this sense of commandedness, and for Leo Beck, much of what God commands has to do with mor morality, with ethics, you know, ethical monotheism, as the classical reformers used to say. And Beck agrees that at the heart of Judaism is this call to ethical action. But what Beck says here is that God is not just an idea, an ethical ideal. <coughs> There's something about God that we cannot know through our use of reason. The idea of introducing mystery, that which is beyond comprehension, into a theological discussion of liberal Judaism in 1922, believe me, was very, very radical. And after the war, Leo Beck would survive as, you know, I hope you know, he was the leader of the Jewish community in Germany before World War II. He spent much of the war, uh, he was deported to Terezin in Czechoslovakia. After the war, he went to England, then he came to the United States. And he really is someone who was a theologian, but he wasn't up in an ivory tower. You know, he spent his time when he was younger as a congregational rabbi, 
And after the war, he became president of the World Union for Progressive Judaism. And he was really somebody, you know, when I was a kid growing up in the 50s, the only thing we ever learned about in religious school about Israel was the Leo Beck School in Haifa. It was the only thing I really knew about Israel. And so even though we never learned about the theology of Leo Beck, I came to realize very early in my life that Leo Beck was this major influence on the development of Reform Judaism, and really one of the first, if not the first, Reform Jewish theologian to say, wait a minute, you know, we can be rationalists, but that doesn't mean that everything in religion can be rationally explained. And that's why Beck continues, I think, to have a major influence, especially on the Reform movement, both in America, England, and elsewhere. The second person on this list here is Martin Buber. Uh, Martin Buber, born in Vienna. I would describe him as a German Jewish philosopher. He spent much of his adult life in Germany, but after the Nazis came to power, he moved to Jerusalem, where he spent the rest of his life. Uh, he was far too radical for Hebrew University to let him teach theology, so instead they appointed him professor of anthropology and sociology. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, Hebrew University gave him an academic home, and as I said, I mean, he, he spent the rest of his life living, living in first the land of Israel, and later, of course, after 1948, in the state of Israel. Buber is most well known for his book, I Am Thou, or in German, Ich und Du, uh, which I can only, uh, Martin Buber is really one of the most influential Jewish theologians of the 20th century. And yet, if any, if any of you read I Am Thou? So you know it's surprisingly unreadable Right? Honestly, given how great the thoughts are within I and Thou, it's not that easy to read. And interestingly enough, he almost never mentions Judaism in I and Thou. In fact, he mentions Buddhism more than he mentions Judaism in I and Thou. And that's because, as Buber would later explain, he wasn't writing about Jewish religion. He was writing about Jewish religiosity. And there's a difference. And let me just read to you um, some, of, some of this. This is actually um, the, first, the first few sentences of I and Thou. This is how he begins the book, 1923. And then I'll read to you from something he wrote. Um, I think this could have even been a paper that was originally given at this School of Adult Jewish Learning that Franz Rosenzweig had created in Frankfurt. So here's the beginning of I Am Thou. And then for those of you who don't understand that, I'll explain what Buber's talking about. Uh, the attitude of man is twofold, in accordance with the twofold nature of the primary words which he speaks. The one primary word is a combination I hyphen thou. The other primary word is the combination I hyphen it. All real life is meeting. All right, what is he talking about? Here. Essentially, and really this would take me far longer than we have this evening, first of all what Buber is saying is that we don't live in isolation, that there is no such thing as an I. We may think that we have monologues or you know, we, we talk in solitude to ourselves, but for Buber that's not what life is. For him, life is always lived in relationship with other people and with other things. And how we treat those other people and how we treat those other things really depends on who those people or things are and the kind of attitude with which we begin those encounters. So the I is always a subject, right? I am a subject. And let's use the example of people because that's the easiest way to understand I thou. Buber says most of the time when we encounter other people, we encounter them in the mode of I it. That is, I am, an, I am a subject, they are an object. So I'm up at school, student, some student walks down the hall and says, hi, Professor Umansky, how are you? I always say I'm fine, and I keep going. <laughs> if we turned and had a real conversation with everyone who said hello to us every day, we would never walk down a hall. You know, if I'm in the supermarket and the checkout person says, have a nice day, whatever, I'm just going to say, yeah, you too. You're not going to engage in a real conversation with that person because, again, there are only so many hours in the day. So this attitude of I, it, for Buber, is not a negative thing. It's a necessary thing. We would never be able to use a pen 
or drive a car, or for me and my classes, write on a, on a whiteboard. If we didn't go into those moments in the attitude of subject to object, I and it. The I-it mode is one of mastery. It's one of control. It's one in which we hold back a lot because, again, it's really something that's utilitarian. And for Buber, you are never going to find God in an I-it encounter. But there are those fleeting moments when we get to encounter another person or a work of art or something in nature through the mode of subject to subject where we are seized by the uniqueness of that person or that object, where it's a reciprocal kind of relationship, where I am moved and that person or that thing is moved. And Buber has a whole mini section in I and Thou when he says, do I really think I can have an I-Thou encounter with a tree? And he says that he thinks it's possible. He said, I don't know what the tree feels, But he said, I know that there are those moments when I am seized by the uniqueness of a particular tree. And I'm not just thinking, okay, tree, it's in bloom, blah, 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 keep walking. But again, seized by the particular leaves or the particular flowers. And for Buber, it is possible to have an I-thou encounter at any time and in anywhere. For Buber, probably the last place you're going to have an I-thou encounter is in synagogue at services. Uh, For Buber, there was no better way to kill the spiritual moment than to be reading about God in a prayer book. Because for Buber, and again, you have to make this jump with me, but it's part of what makes him a liberal Jew. For him, God is to be found in and between every I-thou encounter. So for him to find the sacred, to find God, you don't go to a synagogue and sit and read a prayer book. In fact, for Buber, God could never be described. Because once you start describing God, you've already turned God into an object. It's the same thing with people. You know, if you were to ask me about some person that I know, if I start to say, well, you know, she has brown hair and brown eyes and she's 5'5 and blah, 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 once I do that, again, this isn't a value judgment. I'm already talking about that person in an I, it mode. But there are those moments when we lose ourselves in the encounter, when we actually lose track of time, when we are truly listening to what that person says, when we are doing something together with them, maybe engaging in social action, maybe just helping out our parents. Whatever that moment is for Buber, you can never stay in that mode too long, but it's in those moments for Buber that one actually encounters God. So Martin Buber said, God can be addressed, but God can never be expressed. That is, once we describe God, we have already reduced God to this level of I, it. For Buber, as I said before, most of us need to live most of our lives in the I, it moments. But as Buber wrote in I, and thou, all real living is meeting. In other words, he doesn't say all living is meeting. He's saying that those moments that make life worthwhile is those moments when we connect with someone or with something in a subject-to-subject relation. And that's where we find this reality that we call God. Or for Buber, God becomes the eternal thou, the eternal you. He then wrote sometime in the early 1920s, it's collected in a group of his essays in 1923, he says, renewal of Judaism means in reality renewal of Jewish religiosity, not religion. Religiosity means activity, the elemental entering into relation with the absolute. Religion means passivity, an acceptance of the handed down command. Religion means preservation, religiosity renewal. God does not want to be believed in, to be debated and defended by us, but simply to be realized through us. Um, Buber, as I said, has been tremendously influential in the development of liberal Jewish theology, and I'll talk more about that as we go through some of these things in the handbook. The other European Jewish theologian, very different from Buber, but actually a colleague and a friend of Buber's, was Franz Rosenzweig. Uh, Franz Rosenzweig is really best remembered, I would say, for the example of his life as much as he is for his theology. If you want to talk about unreadable, 
His magnum opus, The Star of Redemption, is almost impossible to plow through. I have plowed through it. It's a very long book, and it's it's not even worth going into here. It's, it's a very dense philosophy in which Rosas Five tried to talk about what does it mean to be a true religion. And in his book, and there are, there are many theologians today, liberal theologians, who were very influenced by what Rosas Five wrote in The Star of Redemption. Uh, basically, Rosas Five said that for a religion to be true, it has to have six irreducible elements. God, man and the world, that is God is not man, man is not God, the human being is not the world, and that they are, cre that they are connected through creation, revelation, and redemption. And again, I don't have time to go through Rosenzweig's theology in The Star of Redemption, but I do want to at least quote from Rosenzweig writing in the 1920s when he really fully turned his life around. What happened was Rosenzweig grew up in a wealthy, assimilated uh, Jewish family. And in 1913, when he was at the University of Leipzig, he basically re-met this distant cousin of his who he had once known, and he said, you know, hi, how are you, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out that since they had last seen each other, this friend slash cousin of his, uh, Eugene Rosenstock, had converted to Christianity. And the more this friend slash cousin talked about Christianity, the more Rosenzweig thought, you know, I'd like to find God myself. And again, he never really, you know, he went to religious school as a kid, but he never paid attention. He really didn't know much about Judaism. And he thought, well, maybe I should consider converting to Christianity too. And then he made a kind of crazy move. He decided that if he were going to be a Christian, he would become a Christian the way the early Christians did in the first century. That is, he would first become a Jew, and then from there he'd become a Christian. Kind of a crazy rationale. But, you know, the first Christians were Jews. And so Rosenzweig decided that he would go to Rosh Hashanah services. And he went to Rosh Hashanah services, and he had this moment where he really began to feel the presence of God. And he went back 10 days later in Yom Kippur. And he really strongly felt God's presence. And he came to realize that for him, one didn't need Jesus in order to find God. That he could experience God directly. And it led him into what he called a life of return. That is, he became, became more and more interested not just in learning about Judaism, but in living Judaism. And he basically created this school of adult Jewish learning in Frankfurt so that other adult Jews could also learn about Judaism so as to begin to practice Judaism. And here's what he says in one of the early speeches that he gave at this school of Jewish learning. He said, what we mean by Judaism, the Jewishness of the Jewish human being, is something inside the individual that makes him a Jew, something infinitesimally small yet immeasurably large, his most impenetrable secret, yet evident in every gesture and every word, especially in the most spontaneous of them. The Jewishness, I mean, is no literature. It can be grasped through neither the writing nor reading of books. It is only lived, and perhaps not even that. One is it. Nothing Jewish is alien to me. All recipes, whether Zionist, Orthodox, or liberal, produces caricatures of men that become more ridiculous the more closely the recipes are followed. There is no one recipe alone that can make a person Jewish, and hence, because he is a Jew and destined to a Jewish life, a full human being, recipe, the recipe is to have no recipe. You know, when people, people always ask me, you know, what kind of Jew are you? And I have to say, for me, the impact of Rosenzweig really has been to throw off those recipes. You know, I'm, I'm affiliated with Reformed Synagogue, but I wouldn't say my identity is just being a Reformed Jew. Uh, and this whole idea of, of embracing Judaism and living a more full Jewish life, you know, is really something that in liberal circles really begins with Rosa's fight. You know, what makes him liberal? You know, at the end of the day, before he died in 1929, Rosenzweig had become as fully observant as he could be. You know, he had um, amyolateral sclerosis and spent the last four years of his life completely paralyzed. And he still continued to write several books. 
It's unbelievable. Um, by the end of his life, he could still blink his eyes, and apparently he would dictate what he wanted to write to his wife by blinking the letters of the alphabet, and she would write this down. It's quite, it's quite incredible. Um, he collaborated with Martin Buber on a German translation of the Bible while he was completely paralyzed. Um, and the famous story about Rosenzweig, there are many famous stories about him, but one is that one day when he was lying in his hospital bed, and this is apparently when he could still speak, although he couldn't move, someone came in to see him and said, you know, tell me, Herr Rosenzweig, do you lay to fill in? Meaning you've gotten so observant, you know, you come from a totally assimilated background, how far have you come? Do you actually even lay to fill in? And Rosenzweig's famous response was not yet. <laughs> right, now again, he was paralyzed, okay? The speaker who asked him this, and Rosenzweig himself knew he was never gonna lay to fill in, but the answer to the question was again, nothing Jewish is alien to me. What makes him liberal? What makes Franz Rosenzweig a liberal theologian is that he begins with the individual. He doesn't begin with God. He begins with individual Jews deciding that they will figure out for themselves what way of living a Jewish life is most meaningful by jumping in. You know, for him, you should do that which you consider doable. That is the commandments, traditional commandments that you consider doable. And he said that which is not doable yet. And Rosenzweig in the last nine years of his life, had the confidence that if Jews began to live the laws which had been externally imposed upon them, that they could be transformed into personally meaningful commandments. Now, I only have like 10 minutes left before I want to open this up to questions, so I really want to go through at least some, if not all, of the rest of the thinkers here. And I think as I do, you're going to get to see the influence of some, if not all, of these European thinkers on them. Uh, the first person who I certainly would not want to omit, because I would say he really is the major reform Jewish theologian of the 20th century, and that's Eugene Borowitz, who's been teaching at Hebrew Union College in New York for a long time. Would you say half a century? I, I don't know. It, it I could be. It, it could well be. Uh, and... When I first studied with Gene Borowitz back in the late 1970s, I mean, he was very much of a Buberian, very much influenced by Buber. Um, today, I would say you know, there are a number of other major theological influences on him. But he's the person in the United States who really created within liberal Jewish circles what he calls covenant theology. And I think covenant theology shares a great deal in common with Martin Buber's understanding of I vow as reciprocal. So for Borowitz, for liberal Jews or reformed Jews, he came to understand that if we see ourselves in covenantal relationship with God, then it shouldn't be a relationship of God commanding and us obeying. Instead, there needs to be more responsibility on our part for the world, just as there has to be responsibility on the part of God. And so this is from uh, Borowitz's Renewing the Covenant, uh, which he wrote in 1991, at a time when I think he'd already shifted, uh, I would say a little away from the kind of Buber universalism that you see in I and Thou, towards a more specific understanding of what it means to be a Jewish self. That is not just an autonomous self, not just a modern self, but actually a liberal Jewish self. He says, the Jewish self lives personally and primarily in involvement with the one God of the universe. Whereas the biblical rabbinic Jew was almost entirely theocentric, the contemporary Jewish self claims a more active role in the relationship with God. When we live in covenantal closeness with God, we acquire unique dignity and power and can hope to remain whole even when burdened by the world's injustice and our own heavy sins. A Jewish relationship with God inextricably binds selfhood and ethnicity with its multiple ties of land, language, history, traditions, fate, and faith. With autonomy, an, integ an integral part of Jewishness, some subjectivity will inevitably center our Jew enter our Jewish practice. Our simultaneous responsibilities to self, to God, to the Jewish past, present, and future, and to humankind as a whole will frequently clash with one another, leading to different views as to which should have greater weight. Yet I am more anxious about the corporate than the personal aspect of Jewish selfhood, and therefore eagerly await the day when enough Jewish selves choose to live in ways sufficiently similar 
that we can create common patterns among us, a communal lifestyle, richly personal, yet Jewishly grounded, would be the Jewish self's equivalent of halakha, or law. Right? So Jean Borowitz is taking a very different position than that of Franz Rosenzweig. You know, Franz Rosenzweig, remember the tefillin incident, you know, for him, not yet, right? Nothing Judaism is alien to me. Eugene Borowitz, as a reform rabbi, as a reform theologian, really still recognizes the importance of autonomy and the right of the individual Jew to say no. You know, that there are certain laws that I don't want to follow, that I'm never going to follow. And so Borowitz, in his thinking, holds on to this concept of autonomy, but he comes to realize that if Jews want to share something in common, not only with one another, but if they want to create a spirituality that in fact is Jewish, not just spiritual, but Jewish, then maybe Reform Jews really need to think about, dare I say it, the concept of obligation, the concept of religious obligation. It's hard to say that in Reform circles. You know, you're thinking, what's so radical about obligation? How many of you like to be told what to do? You know, and could in reform synagogues, could there really be a reform halakha? Meaning, could there really be a set of 20, 30 commandments which we would have to follow in order to join a reform congregation? It's not going to happen. Uh, there are a number of reform theologians, liberal theologians, who have talked about what would it mean to create a liberal halakha. But I would say, um, although that discussion is of interest to people like me who love studying theology, it's not really something that most lay reform Jews are ready to talk about. You know, I think we first have to talk about the idea of obligation in and of itself. We are not going to give up autonomy. I don't see that as happening. I think Jean Borowitz is absolutely right. But the question is, when are we ready to let go of some of our autonomy to create communities that are Jewish? You know, classical reform Judaism, the reform Judaism of the late 19th, early 20th century, maintained that to be a good Jew is to be a good human being. And the reality is that my parents didn't have to keep kosher or lay to fill in or go to synagogue services three times a day to know that they were Jewish. My parents encountered enough anti Semitism that they didn't have to think twice about whether or not they were Jews. Mm -hmm. But for my generation, born in America, and especially for my children's generation, we feel totally American. The question is, how can our lives be fully Jewish? And I would say that what Jews, certainly Reform Jews, liberal Jews would acknowledge, is you don't have to be Jewish to be a good human being. And so if all Reform Judaism is, is about ethical monotheism, if all we believe, and it's still a lot to believe, but if we believe that to be a good Jew is simply to be a good human being, what's Jewish about liberal Judaism? And so it has led a number of liberal Jews, including Eugene Borowitz, to think more about living a life of observance. There may well be some reformed Jews who want to go the route of Franz Rosenzweig and actually become fully observant and have, in Rosenzweig's words, the confidence that if they become observant, that those commandments will have personal meaning for them. Or they might want to take the route of Jean Borowitz, where different Reformed Jews will choose different paths. But for him, the important thing is, is for individuals who are liberal selves to become Jewish selves. That is, to make their lives in whatever way they choose more concretely Jewish. And as he says at the end here, he hopes that those Jews will find in common enough in their practice so that they can come to see themselves as part of a community. And here I would say, since I know now I'm really not going to have time to go all through, through all of these sources, here I would say this really reveals the influence, the great influence of Mordechai Kaplan on Reform Judaism. Uh, Mordechai Kaplan was a late 19th and 20th century conservative rabbi. He founded the Reconstructionist Movement beginning in 1922 with the founding of the Society of Advanced Judaism here in New York. Uh, and Kaplan has had an enormous influence, both on obviously Reconstructionist and conservative thought, because he was the dean of the Teachers Institute up at Jewish Theological Seminary for a long time, and, and, and influenced and trained generations of religious school teachers in the conservative movement. 
But his ideas have actually been claimed by Reform Judaism as our own. In fact, in the 1999 Statement of Principles by the Central Conference of American Rabbis, they have two ideas that they say are central to Reform Judaism without making it clear that those ideas were first articulated by Mordechai Kaplan. And the first idea is really what Gene Borowitz is talking about, which is this idea of unity and diversity. That we can have liberal Jewish communities without everybody practicing their Judaism in exactly the same way. And that idea was very much Kaplan's. The other idea of Kaplan that makes its way into the 1909 set of principles is Kaplan's famous description of giving halakha, or rabbinic law, a vote, but not a veto. Now, in 1885 and in 1937, in the Pittsburgh platform and the Columbus platform, halakha didn't get a vote. Right? Reformed Jews only saw ethical monotheism as essential to practicing or living a Jewish life and really rejected or did away with ceremonials, what they called ceremonials and observances that they saw as obsolete. But this whole idea of teaching Reformed Jews more about traditional practices and let them then decide whether to keep them or reject them, that idea really begins with Mordecai Kaplan. And again, I think it really has become part and parcel of American Reformed Judaism today, and I wish I had more time to talk about it. Um, Harold Schulweis is a conservative rabbi, very much influenced by the ideas of Kaplan. You know, uh, Kaplan, and you know, I just, I, I, I really do want to leave time for questions, so I won't even read um, this part here that I that I gave you by Kaplan. But essentially, Mordechai Kaplan was the first and maybe the last Jew to offer a definition of God. Uh, Kaplan said in one of his many, in many of his many books. He said, God is a power that makes for salvation. Now, what he meant by salvation, and hopefully you'll go home and you read this handout, by that he meant both self-transcendence and a community's transcending where it is to become a better community. Right? In other words, for Kaplan, and the term salvation is very unfortunate because I think you know, we in the Western world hear salvation, we think of an otherworldly Christian salvation. Why did Mordechai Kaplan, why did he say that? Well, Matthew Arnold, the great 19th century British poet, he defined God as a power not ourselves that makes for salvation. So a lot of it, I think, you know, just takes its wording from Matthew Arnold, but Mordecai Kaplan meant something very, very different. Uh, and Mordecai Kaplan was the first to realize that if Jews really wanted to be together as Jews, maybe the way to do it wasn't to create more and more prayer services, Maybe it was to create more and more ways for Jews to get together as Jews. So the whole creation of what Kaplan called synagogue centers, what we today call synagogues, are largely due to Mordecai Kaplan. You know, having a social hall, an auditorium with a stage, um, some synagogue, my synagogue, we have a basketball court. I don't know if you have a basketball court here. Not yet. No, not yet, okay? Uh, this whole idea that at the end of the day, most Jews go to synagogue to see their friends, and not necessarily to commune with God. Uh, and Kaplan saw that as something positive, because to him, Jews and above and beyond everything else were a people. They were a civilization. And they were people who actually created their own religion, which we call Judaism. Uh, and so Schulweis, I wanted to just mention Schulweis, and you know, hopefully you'll be able to, to read. This is a wonderful book by Harold Schulweis, uh, for those who can't believe. An incredibly readable but very smart and very smart theology, uh, where he raises all sorts of questions about, about God. And being influenced by Kaplan, you know, Kaplan, because for Kaplan, God is a power. That means that for Mordecai Kaplan, God is not a supernatural being up here or anywhere else. <clears throat> Instead, Kaplan talked about God as this power or process that makes us, again, more than we think we can be, makes our communities more than they are right now. And so Harold Shulwai suggests that maybe we should just do away with the notion of God as a noun altogether. That instead of talking about God as Lord, King, whatever, that we begin instead, instead of talking about Elohim, or God in Hebrew, that we use the Hebrew word Elohut, which means divinity. And instead, maybe our path to the sacred isn't trying to find some supernatural being. Maybe our path to the sacred 
is in doing godly acts. That is, for sure, wise, then God becomes a verb, or really an adverb, although he says, I propose changing God from a noun to a verb. In other words, to act in a way, you know, to act mercifully, to act with compassion, to act justly, that those are ways of finding God, because maybe that's really what divinity, what divinity is. Uh, given the shortage of time, I guess I'm going to have to kind of cut to the chase. I know I, I promised Rabbi Davidson that I would at least talk about my own theology. So I think for two minutes I'm going to end by saying something about the creation of Jewish feminist theology, which to me owes a great deal to Martin Buber. Uh, although certainly Jewish feminists have not taken Jewish feminist theology in the way that Martin Buber envisioned. But Martin Buber by saying that all God language is inadequate, you know, that once we describe God, we've already turned God into an object. For Jewish feminist theologians, beginning in the 1970s, it really was the thinking of Martin Buber that led a number of Jewish women, primarily in America, but not exclusively, to ask, wait a minute, you know, why do, especially if all of us are creating the image of God, then why are our liturgical images of God predominantly, if not exclusively, male? Now, Christian feminist theologians have asked of Christianity the exact same thing, because Christians also believe that all human beings are created in the image of God. But there's a second, more Jewish question that Jewish feminists, including me, began to ask, which is if for us as Jews, if we believe that God is neither male nor female, then again, why are our images of God exclusive, predominantly, if not exclusively, male? That is, aren't female images of deity as inadequate as male images of deity? Right? Isn't the idea of saying God really is a king or God really is a lord, is that idolatrous? Because as Jews, we don't believe that God becomes incarnate. So those kinds of questions, which begin really with Martin Buber's questioning, these ways in which Jews have described God for thousands of years, really sets, I would say, Jewish feminist theology in motion. And there are some Jewish feminist theologians like Marsha Falk who then take that and believe that, that God is not a being and that all attempts to create anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic images of deity are, in her words, idolatrous. Uh, and so instead, Marsha, in her book of blessings, where she rewrites all of the Jewish blessings, it's a masterful book, she actually gets rid of masculine God language and all other kinds of problems theologically in our blessings by basically just getting rid of the whole thing. So instead of saying, Baruch Ata Adonai, blessed are you, masculine singular, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, our God, King of the Universe, and then, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Now, in recent reform liturgies, as you probably know, we've tried to substitute for king of the universe, master of the universe, or most recently, ruler of the universe, right? And I would say that in the 1970s and 1980s, Jewish feminist theologians would have been very happy with that change. It still isn't imaging God as female, but at least it's moving away towards exclusively masculine God language. And I wrote several essays in the 1980s in which I talked about the importance of imagining God, not just as king of the universe, but as queen of the universe. Talking about God, not just as father, but God as mother. You know? And, and I, I wrote, again, on and on, and I wasn't the only Jewish feminist theologian who did that. And then in the early 1990s, I realized that what I had been writing was, in a way, was wrong. Because the reality is, that it doesn't matter whether God is king of the universe or queen of the universe, it's the same God. That is, if our images of God, and I really feel this very passionately, if our, if our images of God are those of hierarchical domination, with God up here and us down there, I think it's all too easy for us to say we were just following orders. And to me, very much like Jean Borowitz, living in covenant with God means a reciprocal relationship. And personally, I would love to get rid of images like Lord and King. 
Um, a, because again, I see them as images of hier hierarchical domination. And secondly, because for those of us who are, Amer who are Americans, I think image and God as king and lord is just kind of silly. You know, it doesn't move me in the way that it would if I actually lived under a monarchy. I was talking today to my students at Fairfield in my modern Jewish theology class about the image of God as shepherd. I never saw a shepherd, much less met a shepherd, until I was in my 50s, when my children and my husband and I went to Jordan. And it was the first time I ever saw a shepherd. But up until then, I just couldn't relate. What does it mean? Again, but 2,000 years ago, to create that image of God as shepherd at a time in which many Jews were farmers and really understood what it meant to tend one's flock, it was a very important image. So in terms of imaging the divine, you know, one direction that liberal Judaism has gone is towards more inclusive, or what the reform movement calls gender-neutral language. Uh, that's not a phrase I like very much, because the reality is, is that none of us in this room are gender-neutral. Right? We all have genders. We are either male or female, and in rabbinic Judaism, gender matters. So to pretend that there are no differences between, between men and women and we can be gender-inclusive, to me, honestly, is silly. Um, if I haven't convinced you that adding to our images, yeah, I'm not really saying we should get rid of Avinu Malkeinu. Everybody asks me, what about Avinu Malkeinu? Mm -hmm. You know, our father, our king. You know what? I love the melody. Mm -hmm. And I think most liberal Jews who like Avinu Malkeinu, it's not so much the words. It's the melody. And I'm not saying get, in, get, get rid of a lot of prayers that we have. I'm just saying I think that we would do well to add some new ones that speak from our experience. Uh, ones that are images that are less those of hierarchical domination. You know, God is teacher, maybe even God is friend. Uh, and, and so I think that we have a long way to go in terms of liturgical change, but certainly in liberal Judaism and all branches of liberal Judaism, there have been many, many changes. I want to end, since really I'm out of time, and I want to be able to spend at least 15 minutes um, entertaining questions. Uh, it's hard for me to choose because I actually love all of these sources, but I guess I'm going to have to end with one of my favorite theologians and certainly someone who has really influenced the development of liberal theology, and that's Abraham Joshua Heschel. Mm -hmm. Now, Heschel was born in Poland, but he came to America when he was still fairly young. He wrote in English and wrote beautifully in English. Uh, and I think that's a major reason why he's considered to be an American Jewish theologian. Uh, he taught at Hebrew Union College, and then he left and you know, came to New York and taught at Jewish Theological Seminary, where he spent you know, the remaining years of his life. Uh, and in this quote from Heschel, this is from Heschel's masterful book, uh, his magnum opus that really deserves to be called a magnum opus, God in Search of Man. Uh, and you know, it was only after I read Heschel many times that I realized how Jewish a title this book is. Uh, it is rooted in that story in Genesis where Adam and Eve eat of the fruit and they realize they're naked and God is in the garden and they're ashamed that they're naked so they hide. And God calls out to them, where are you? Right? God is looking for them. And Heschel takes that moment and he uses it to call his book God in Search of Man. In other words, and this is Abraham Joshua Heschel on one foot, for Heschel it's not just that we need God, just as much God needs us. Because if it weren't for human beings, all of God's teachings wouldn't be put into reality. You know, Heschel was an observant Jew his whole life. Uh, he very much emphasized the importance of ethics, and, you know, as you may know, I mean, he really, he was one of really the few more traditionally religious Jews who was out there on the front lines with Dr. King, you know, marching for civil rights, one of the first. Um, rabbis to speak out against the war in Vietnam. Uh, and for Heschel, you know, that was, that was an important part of being Jewish. But it wasn't the only part of being Jewish. Uh, and he never felt he had to defend his observance. But one of the things that Heschel wrote about is this concept of revelation. So I guess I have to close with this big theological idea that we could talk about for several weeks, which is for those of us who are liberal Jews, if we don't believe that literally 3,000 years ago, God dictated the Torah to Moses at Mount Sinai. What do we believe? What do we mean when we talk about revelation? Did God speak back at Mount Sinai? Does God continue, if at all, to speak today? And this from God in Search of Man is Heschel talking about what for him revelation means. 
He says, what happened at Sinai? Revelation was both an event to God and an event to man. How did Israel know that what their eye and ear perceived in the desert of Sinai was not a phantom? Indeed, there is no perception that may not be suspected of being a delusion. What we see may be an illusion. That we see can never be questioned. The thunderbolt and lightning at Sinai may have been merely an impression, but to have suddenly been endowed with the power of seeing the whole world struck with an overwhelming awe of God was a new sort of perception. God does not reveal himself. He only reveals his way. Judaism does not speak of God's self-revelation, but of the revelation of his teaching for man. In other words, for Heschel, Heschel says, I don't know if God literally gave the commandments of Mount Sinai. I don't know what happened. But I know that something happened to those people who were there. We have a record of it in the Torah. And that moment, that moment of actually finding God, of hearing God's voice, of listening for God's voice, changed those people forever. And Heschel writes that with the confidence that we, all of us, can have those kinds of moments of what he would call radical amazement. That's a Heschelian term, that we can all have those moments of radical amazement. And probably we're not going to get there through our use of reason, but it'll be some kind of non-rational moment, the moments that Leo Beck talks about as those moments of mystery. And that, I would say, for all of, the spe- all of the thinkers that I included in this handout and that I spoke about tonight is very much what it means to be a liberal Jew in search of God. So thank you very much. I know we have the questions, right? Okay. We have a few minutes for questions. So yeah. Questions for Dr. Mansky? On any, any liberal Jewish theologian. It doesn't have to be someone I talked about tonight. Yeah. Do you plan to write a new prayer book? I'm just going to ask you to repeat the do I Do I plan to write a new prayer book? Yes. No, but I am actually writing a Jewish feminist theology. Uh, it's very hard. You know, most of my books have been largely historical. They, they've been about different aspects of Jewish thought set within an historical context. And this work that I've been writing for the last few years really attempts to construct a Jewish theology. Um, And it's hard. I I really don't know if I'm going to actually finish this book because when I write about history, you know, I find something looking through different documents and I really come to believe that my take on that historical moment is the right one. doesn't mean that other people can't find new sources and write something that's closer to the truth than what I write. But I find that when I write theology... I write down a sentence or two, and then I step back with a moment of doubt. And I always say to myself, well, how do you know? So I applaud people like Marsha Falk, who actually you know, tackles the entire Jewish liturgy. But for me to just begin to even articulate who or what I think God is, for me, that's going to probably take another few years. So, Any other questions? Mm-hmm. Would you say there's a difference in liberal theology from the conservative rabbis versus the reconstructionist rabbis versus the reform rabbis? Is there a difference? I mean, what I hear is that reform kind of came to the same place that the conservatives, meaning if we can call Heschel conservative, that Heschel is coming from. They're all merging in some place. But are there distinctions in the theology, in the liberal theology of each of those groups? Well, there used to be a distinction between Reconstructionist theology and Reform theology. But the Reconstructionist movement is now part of the World Union for Progressive Judaism. And for all intents and purposes, there isn't much difference in Reconstructionist theology today than Reform. You know, when Mordechai Kaplan wrote his prayer book in 1945, he took out all references to chosenness and to miracles because he didn't believe in miracles like the parting of the Red Sea, and he didn't believe in chosenness because if God is a power, how can a power choose a particular group of people? But the Reconstructionist movement only opened its rabbinical seminary in 1968, and it's still quite small. So there are more and more Reconstructionist congregations that are served by Reform rabbis. And I would say that I've been to more Reconstructionist synagogues that have put back 
the traditional prayers before and after the Torah reading that do talk about chosenness than I've been to Reconstructionist synagogues that don't have that. So, so much of the influence of Reconstructionist Judaism, like Reform Judaism, depends who the rabbi is, you know, and where that congregation wants to go. So I'm really going to say that today, um, the Reconstructionist prayer book still talks about God as a power or process, but there are many Reconstructionist congregations that insert their own prayers in which they think of God as a being. Um, theoretically, there, is a, there, is, there are some differences between conservative and reform theology. But in reality, um, I would say the two theologies are very, very close. And where the biggest difference is, is conservative rabbis, I don't even want to say versus liberal rabbis, because the reality is that there are many reform rabbis who live a Jewish life identical to the life lived by conservative rabbis. The problem with theology in the conservative movement, and I actually have written about this. I wrote an article for a conference that Elliot Dorff convened many years ago of conservative Jews, mostly rabbis and me. Um, and I really didn't understand how I got invited to this conference, other than that I'm very influenced by, by Elliot Dorff, who's a major figure in conservative Jewish theology. Um, but I, I wrote a paper called Creating a Theological Language of and for Conservative Jews, because I think conservative Judaism does have a specific theological language. And it's largely rooted in the teachings of Solomon Schechter, who came over to the United States in 1902 and really took what at the time was a dying rabbinical seminary and created a movement. But the reality is that most conservative Jews don't know who Solomon Schechter is other than that you have Solomon Schechter day schools named after him. Uh, I know Arnie Eisen, since he's become chancellor of JTS, has really tried to give talks and write essays, you know, trying to get more conservative Jews to learn more about Solomon Schechter. But I would say right now where conservative, where the conservative laity is, uh, I think that I would say they don't speak a unique theological language, so the differences aren't, aren't that big. Franz Rosenzweig, I would say, has today become most influential among a group of people that we could call Balei Teshuva. Jews just like Rosenzweig, who weren't previously observant, who just you know, embraced observance wholeheartedly. So for modern Orthodox Jews, especially those who don't come from an observant background, I would say Rosenzweig has become especially influential. And I'm sure he's influential to conservative rabbis as well. But uh, I belonged to a conservative congregation for 17 years, and I would say that for me the biggest surprise, and I belong to a reform and a conservative congregation, for me the biggest surprise is that the Judaism that my fellow conservative congregants practiced was identical to the Judaism that my fellow congregants in my reform synagogue practiced. Uh, and I don't think the experience that I had in my synagogue or in the two conservative synagogues up in Fairfield where I teach, I don't think those are e exceptional in any way. That's my son, Abe. It's my oldest son. He just moved back to New York, so. Hi, Abe. I have a question. Yes. That's a good question. So you're saying if we as liberal Jews want to create our own way of living as Jews and it's not a life that fully traditionally observant, right? Mm -hmm. You're saying, will we, how, do, how does that leave us in terms of how Orthodox Jews see us? Is that your question? Or how we how see, do them? see them? Well, how do we see them? Um, yeah, that's a, that is a tough question. Um, that's a hard question. Uh, and I really think that you know, there's Orthodox Judaism in the abstract. And then there are real Orthodox Jews. And I have to thank Yitz Greenberg for allowing me to teach at Klal, um, in the early 1990s, where I got to teach uh, 
religiously committed Jews, but more so than that, what I got out of teaching for this you know, Center for Jewish Learning and Leadership that Yitz created was for the first time in my life, I got to teach and to be in workshops and study sessions with modern Orthodox rabbis. And it was really the first time in my life that I met knowledgeable Orthodox Jews who were interested in dialoguing with, with non-Orthodox Jews. And I would say up until then, uh, I either didn't know, I didn't know many Orthodox Jews and the ones that I did completely dismissed me and didn't see that what I was practicing was real Judaism. So I, you know, kind of dismissed them as well. But I think I, now I live in my plains. I've been there now for seven years, but I've been a member of the synagogue I belong to for over 25 years. And every year before the High Holy Days, or even during the whole high, on, on Tashli, you know, when we go to the water and cast our sins in the, every year for I don't know how many years, we have at Tashli and in these study sessions held before Rosh Hashanah, participation by our two reform rabbis at my synagogue, Kol Ami, Les Bronstein at the Reconstructionist Synagogue, Bet Am. We have the rabbi, we have Gordon Tucker, who's a conservative synagogue uh, at Temple Israel. We always have the rabbi of the modern Orthodox synagogue, and we have the rabbi of young Israel. And so to have all of these clergy participate together, both in teaching congregants from all the different, you know, we have, they have different study sessions, and they're at the different congregations studying together. And the whole idea that we can actually do Tashli together has really changed my mind about how I look at Orthodox Jews. Um, you know, I'll just be honest with all of you. Here, my son, you know, really knows how to push my buttons. Um, for me as a woman, I'm not comfortable going to Orthodox services. I'll just come out and say it. I think if I were a man, I'd have a very different attitude towards Orthodox Judaism. But I've been in enough Orthodox synagogues, um, sitting in the women's gallery, hardly being able to hear, not fully being able to see, not having women be counted in the minion or called to the Torah, and that is not a Judaism that I choose to practice. And I'll even put a value judgment on it. I really think that Reform Judaism, liberal Judaism, this includes conservative, reconstructionist, Reform Judaism, by seeing women as, as fully Jewish as men, those are the kind of Jewish communities that I want to live in. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we can't have respect for the commitment of of Orthodox Jews. I would say one thing Orthodox Jews have that we could learn from is what it means to live in community. You know, and if I could sit through a Shabbat service at an Orthodox synagogue and I were there alone, I'm certain that someone would invite me for lunch. That what someone would see me sitting by myself and they'd say, you have a place to go for Shabbos? And if I said no, they'd invite me. And you know, I go to my synagogue alone, alone all the time I know people, I have a lot of friends in my synagogue, but no one has ever said to me spontaneously on a Saturday morning, oh, what are you doing for lunch? You want to come over. So there's a lot that we as Reformed Jews can learn from Orthodox Jews. But how we view Orthodoxy, I don't think we have to be apologetic for being Reformed Jews. There was a time uh, when I was teaching at HUC when Eugene Borowitz went through this period where he kept, I, because he didn't want to just call himself a reform theologian, he wanted to embrace all of liberal Judaism, he would call himself a non-Orthodox Jew. And I said, Gene, that, you know, we, we shouldn't define ourselves by who we're not. We need to define ourselves by who we are. And I think he moved beyond that period. You know, but it was awkward at first. How do we... How do we call ourselves liberal Jews as if there were a community of Reconstructionist, conservative, and reformed Jews? Uh, and there isn't a physical community, but I think there's a sense in which those of us who are not Orthodox should identify ourselves by what we are, even if we take Rosenzweig's suggestion, which I like a lot, that we just call ourselves Jewish. You know, that we not attach these recipes to the kinds of Jews that we are, but we just call ourselves Jewish. Please join me. Well, thank you, John.